see here. So my presentation, uh, to take it to a little different topic here, we've been talking quite a bit about sustainability. And uh, when I look at sustainability and I look at risk, I think they are kind of very similar. And that, so that's going to be my discussion uh, this morning. Uh, Dr. Hassan is the person who actually put a lot of the material together. He's one of our EHS and uh, uh, PhDs uh, back in the office and has been working quite extensively uh, regarding the subject of uh, risk assessment. Uh, let me see. There we go. So that's the agenda. So I'm going to start off the, the discussion talking about some real life examples about risk management just to get us kind of warmed up here. I have a, a very simple example. I call it my swimming pool example. I'm going to get into the risk assessment process. And I'm also going to talk about developing risk assessment criteria. It varies, obviously, uh, per business. I'm going to also talk about uh, a speed and vulnerability. I have an example about one and a half days versus one and a half weeks versus one and a half years. And I'll explain that uh, a little bit later on. Also about management activities related to risk, uh, putting it into practice. So uh, besides uh, studying and developing a plan, actually make the plan actually work, how people use it. And then the different steps of the risk management uh, process, what I call the plan. And then I'm going to also end it here talking a bit about the benefits of an integrated ERA risk management module uh, to just finish it off. So uh, I think Sar stole a little bit of my thunder here this morning because uh, I think you all know what ERA stands for by now unless you were not paying attention. So obviously, <laughs> environmental risk uh, assessment. You could request them. Yeah, OK. So <laughs> close your ears. <laughs> and let's ask that question. What does ERA stand for again? So uh, what happened going back 22 years ago, there was a program in the United States called the UST program or the Underground Storage Tank program. And what happened is uh, we actually got involved uh, down near the governor's mansion in Raleigh, uh, the capital of North Carolina. And we were actually engaged by a UST company, a hydrogeologist that actually hired us to perform what we call a risk assessment on the uh, a client's property. And we had to look at, um, on that intersection, there were three uh, gas stations, obviously, with underground storage tanks. And so we had to evaluate all the sampling data from the lab and define to the client what were the risk of underground water contamination from petrochemical, obviously gasoline, diesel, uh, from those uh, stations. So we actually were doing risk assessment back 22 years ago. So what is a, uh, what I call uh, enterprise risk management, uh, or ERM, right? So obviously, it is a process of planning, organizing, leading, and controlling. The activities of the organization, obviously, to minimize the effects of risk, right? And an organizational's capital and earnings. And that goes back to kind of what Allison talked about and Aaron talked about it with the GRI, right? There's also uh, money involved in, in this, right? So why do we need uh, what we call uh, risk management, right? So of course, one of the main things I've underlined and put it in red is uncertainty, right, with any organization. So you have to have the ability to manage risk, right? How companies act more confidently on future business decisions. So obviously, if you don't study and evaluate what risks there are to your operations, uh, you may obviously not be prepared to handle them when they occur. So having the accurate knowledge of the risks uh, of your organization would be facing will give you various options on how to deal with the actual potential uh, problems, right? So I have a short video here, and Erin's going to help me out here. Uh, she does have IT experience, you see? <laughs> On the job experience. No, no. I have that a little was... video that's, um, it's going to give us like kind of a little like uh, quiet time here. We can just look at it. And it's kind of to just give you an idea of uh, getting you to think about risk and from a very, very simple uh, example here. Does everybody see that up there? Yeah. And I'll be quiet. <laughs> Mm-hmm. <laughs> 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 
Obviously, that's very simple. But can't you get the general just a bit, right? Oh, your mouse is not, there. You go. Okay. So I'm going to pick up where I left off on the PowerPoint here. So I have an example that I thought would be uh, give you an idea of you know uh, risk and. Uh, so I call this my swimming pool example, and you can refer to it as your facility or your organization made up maybe multiple facilities. So I actually do manage uh, my swimming pool back in Montreal uh, to make sure that it's chlorinated and the temperature is just right for bathing, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a couple of things you have to do to get it's a salt pool, so they get it up and running in the springtime and make sure your pH and you know your your uh, calcium level and you know the all these factors temperature etc but once you get into the pool you start getting some outside um, uncontrollable factors I call them right so you can get rain so it will fill up the pool so the water level goes up and basically um, you may have to empty out some water right or uh, it may get real hot and in the hot time of the year in the summer you'll get Evaporation? I don't know what that is. <laughs> okay. Okay. It's getting a laugh. And then you may get particulate matter in the form of leaves and other, you know, items that blow into your pool. So the point I want to make here is that risk, even though if you analyze your facility or even your multiple sites in that, you may think that you have everything under control, but actually, well, guess what? When you start studying it, there, there are factors that may not be in your control. So when I talked to Dr. Hassan going through his material, yeah, he brought up something about what he called the integral risk management necessity. And talking to him a bit about this, he kept referring to this graph here you see, uh, expected enterprise value on one axis versus risk level. So he's trying to explain me this concept. And I said, you know, Hassan, I think we have something what we call CCC, refer to cookies, cake, and candy. And what it's called is the sweet spot. And what is the sweet spot? So when you look at your operation of your business, right, uh, if you want to grow your business, right, if you just keep the status quo and you just keep operating day to day, you're not probably going to grow your business. So you have to take some risk to grow your, your business, right? But if you take too much risk over on the far right-hand side, right, then you may open your business to um, excessive uh, risk-taking and actually uh, consequences. So Dr. Hassan referred to me what is called the sweet spot or optimal risk-taking zone. And that's important because when you're looking at your operation, you have to kind of look at where you are now where you're going in the future, and what are going to be the challenges to your operations. The steps of the risk management process, there's something called ISO 13001, or COSO. So step one is first, obviously, like we talk about, I think Aaron referred to it very nicely about the discovery, right? Identify the, the risk from risk breakdown structure. The second step is to define the primary risk impact area. Third, we have to analyze the risk. The fourth step is to evaluate the risk according to the risk ranking. So you have to actually rank all these risks that you've identified. Fifth step is to identify risk controls to mitigate the risk, right? 
And step number six is assign the risk owner to monitor and review. So you actually have to put somebody in charge of these different risk elements. The risk assessment process, it all starts with measuring. And that kind of goes hand in hand what we do with software, right? I think Sarah referred to it quite, quite well about you know, collecting the data and finding out where we're at, right? So when you look at this, enterprises uh, require risk assessment process that's practical, sustainable, there's that word sustainable, right? And easy to understand. The process must proceed in a structured and disciplined fashion, so people have to abide by certain rules, right? And its purpose is to assess how big the risks are both individually and collectively. If you look at that box, uh, the box there, we've got the first step, and then in the center, we've got some other boxes, and the third step is, of course, to respond to the risk. There's another factor that's involved when you're looking at risk, and it's called time. And I have here some examples, and very recent, obviously, to all of us here in this room, uh, the devastating hurricane that uh, hit South Texas and Houston, the time it took to evolve was very rapid. So when you're looking at the risk, you have to look at also the evolution of you know, reaction to how the event is going to uh, roll out, right? So that actually took place in like one and a half days. Up in the Montreal area the back... difference between a hazard uh, and a risk? Whoops. Easy question? Sorry about that. Apparently not. There appears to be some <laughs> confusion we, between... We have some British shows. lady coming into the presentation. <laughs> A hazard can be identified as anything which can cause harm. Oh, it's the video. A oh, okay. risk is the potential. There we go. It's my YouTube video. It snuck up on me. See, there's a, there's an example of risk, right? I just got it. I got dinged by risk. Minimized. There you go. I thought Hassan was playing a game on it. Yeah, I think Hassan's back at the office hacking into here and, you know. <laughs> So getting back to it, so Houston took one and a half days to develop. Very rapid, the flooding, as you can see by the, the, the photo there. So we had flooding in Montreal back in April. The Great Lakes water levels were very high. The St. Lawrence River, which drains to the you know, ocean, Atlantic Ocean, was very high. And they had to make a decision to open up certain dams. So the flooding there, actually not that far from our office, took place in about one and a half weeks. So it was more controlled. There was more time for people to react and actually do something. Last month, I was traveling for a week in Morocco. And as driving through the countryside, heading toward the Atlas Mountains, uh, I saw to my far right, by the way, driving in a Grand Cherokee uh, of FCA, <laughs> Uh, going through the countryside towards the mountains, uh, I looked over and there was a dam. And I was like, wow, look at the dam. And wow, there's something wrong with this picture, right? So if you look at the top, there's grass at the top and there's grass at the bottom. So this is an example of the risk. So the risk here is you've lost your water, right? And I'm just making an assumption here, but maybe this took one and a half years to happen. So my point being is that the onset of, of an event the timing has to do with the vulnerability of your operations. Developing risk assessment criteria. So the traditional risk analysis defines risk as function of likelihood and impact. Unlikely events occur often, too often and worse with astonishing speed. So that's a perfect example, right? Those events, Houston, uh, unfortunately, we've had another hurricane with Irma just you know, recently. They knew a little bit ahead of time, but you know, the speed, right? So how fast could the risk arise? How fast could you respond or recover? So without understanding the speed of the event will affect how fast you're going to respond, right? And how are you going to recover from it? How much downtime could you tolerate, right? So the, to answer these questions, you need to gauge vulnerability and the speed of the onset. So that's why I really wanted to make you understand with some of the visuals about speed, the previous slide. You have to be able to gauge how vulnerable you are to an event. You have to develop a picture of your needs. And by gauging how quickly it could happen, you understand the need for agility, rapid adaptation. And as you can see at the bottom, there were some boxes there about impact, risk likelihood, vulnerability, and the speed onset. Vulnerability to speed onset varies. And if you look at the bottom here, before I talk a little bit, you can see there's some ranking from one to five, right? So 
For some companies, an onset of event may be very low. It may have very slow onset like the dam in Morocco, right? Or in Houston, very high. Rapid onset, a little warning, instantaneous, and then you have to react to it. So the vulnerability is related to the impact and likelihood, right? And the more vulnerable the entity is to the risk, the higher the impact will be. The speed of onset refers to the time it takes for the risk event to manifest itself, as we saw in the, the photos, right? Or in other words, the time that elapses between the occurrence of an event and the point at which the company first feels its effects. So obviously the folks in Houston felt it kind of pretty fast, right? They were in it. They, had, they couldn't really do much to react. They, it was there. This diagram is referred to what's called the bow tie diagram. And it's what we call accessing risk interactions. And I had a little example here. We have a couple of probably automotive OEMs in, in the, the room this morning, right? When we had the earthquake over in Japan and we had the flooding in Thailand, if you guys remember, it, it affected the supply chain uh, very drastically where we actually had dealerships could not have cars to sell because they didn't have parts to build them. So a bow tie diagram over here is visualizing risk. If you look over on the left hand side, we have what we call the root cause and control, right? Preventative controls. Over to the right is the consequence. Again, when there's a consequence, there has to be a control to that consequence, right? We call the preparedness controls. So how prepared are you if an event happens? And in the center of the bow tie is with the risk. So you see it's, it's a pretty complex you know, um, uh, interaction, but you have to take into account the root cause versus the consequence. And it's, it's like a big picture, basically. Managing activities. So talking about how you're going to actually manage activities related to risk. So create high risk, uh, high uh, risk level strategy, so policy, aligned with strategic business objectives. Develop assigned responsibilities for risk management. You have to align and integrate uh, risk management activities with all processes. So that kind of goes back to the big picture, the, kind of like the swing pool. That's a real simple example, but you have to know really what's out there, what can happen to you, right? And align, uh, okay, and also embed real-time control. So as in the case with Houston, uh, when those folks got the hurricane and got flooded, what are you going to do when it actually is, is, you're in it, right? So related to risk into digital systems as appropriate. So that's going to lead into my next point, is putting it all into practice. So my, my question here is why do you need uh, automation, right? So obviously trying to deal with a lot of information and people have all kinds of things going on in their busy schedules, right? How are you going to be able to manage all this on top of all that, right? So to be effective and sustainable, so there's sustainability again, right? The risk assessment process needs to be simple, practical, and easy to understand. Obviously, if things are real complicated, people are just pushing it aside and they're going to say, well, I'm not doing this. I, I'm busy with all my other day-to-day you know, -day, uh, things to do. So people aren't enough. This is one thing we discovered when Aaron mentioned about that case example, going on site, doing a discovery. This really happens at facilities. So to be efficient, they must be supported by the right technology. Risk management process can be quite challenging without automation. And I think we all, we all get that, right? Especially if the entity is large, complex, and geographically distributed. So if you're distributed, not just say US and Canada or Mexico, but now you're going to other continents, right? You said trying to get the data, Aaron, right? From the European companies, right? Uh, it starts to get even more complex. So ER has adapted what's called a, a risk assessment process according to the modern risk management frameworks such as COSO, ISO 13001, and what I just showed you previously, the bow tie diagram. So to just summarize what the module can do, so it's a repository for all risks created from different modules. So we have ISO, management of change, business process management, uh, incident, which is our safety, right? Ability to constantly register and update risk coming from all the modules, perform qualitative and quantitative risk analysis, monitor and control risk through the project, prioritize the risk based on category, right? 
create a, a breakdown structure, a starting port, point, plan risk responses, and very crucial, this very last bullet here, assign a risk owner. Who is responsible, right? Somebody actually has to be doing the work that's out there. So this is a visual uh, based on the previous slide with the bullets, how it's all going to work. So the risk module basically will be talking with inspection, process safety management, incident, which is safety, ISO, compliance, which is task management, water module, uh, we call it finishing and chemical, uh, you know, chemical management, and business project management module, all tied together. Components of a risk management module. So the first one is risk identification. So the categories, the description, the source, the ID. The second is the analysis and evaluation, right? So once you have the identification, you have to do the analysis. So the qualitative and, of course, quantitative analysis. And the third is the risk response and control. So how are you going to respond, as you saw previously? Having a contingency plan in place, a fallback plan, somebody who's actually going to keep track of all this, a risk owner, and residual risk. So here's a bit of an example over on the left-hand side, uh, and we're going to get into it a little bit more as Sarah explained, uh, getting into the software to kind of show how it's all working, but this is from one of the forms. So basically the risk registration analysis in the system, create and register multiple risks, identify and select primary risk impact area, again conduct the qualitative and quantitative risk assessment, the automatic risk ranking and scoring, and I'm going to get a little bit into that, that's a real important part, and assign multiple controls for a single risk. Case study here, just a, a quick example. So say we had a forklift driver on pallet, uh, he had say about a thousand gallons of hazardous chemical, he's going through another part of the plant, he hits the overhead door while passing through it, and boom, you've got yourself uh, a spill, right? So the risk here is the release of toxic chemical in the plant as a result of the forklift incident. The primary risk impact area would be possibly contamination of underground water, potential loss of your ISO 14001 certification, right? And of course, it could hamper the production line. Now that forklift, you've got a spill, other forklifts can't pass. Risk ranking. High risk action should be taken to compensate for the risk, right? And risk controls. In this forklift uh, driver example, we may want to review and update the forklift training content. So maybe um, that particular uh, operator didn't have proper training and that's why we had the, the accident, right? Uh, maybe you want to install some forklift guards in that passageway going to the other part of the facility. And also include what we call human oversight when moving more than, say, 500 gallons of, of toxic chemical. That's, that's just an example. Creation of multiple and corrective preventive actions. So the example would be, because of financial reasons, raw materials, say, from a local supplier, have been replaced by a new overseas vendor. Product approval. So, and as I mentioned, even like in the OEM supply chain, when earthquake in Japan, the floods in Thailand, uh, they had to kind of scramble and find suppliers, right, to supply the parts for the vehicles. So the risk there, of course, is looking at you've got a new supplier, maybe from a new geographical area of the globe. What is the quality of the raw material, right? may not be the same from your traditional suppliers, right? So as Sarah mentioned, one of the things you may want to do is you may want to send an inspector to the supplier's facility to actually go and see how are they making the piece they're sending you? What's their process? What's the chemicals going into the product, right? So for overseas supply, request maybe a sample of the product to be sent for verification. Make sure what you're thinking you're getting, you're actually going to get that and you're all on the same page. So that's just an example there. There's a little screenshot uh, from our uh, software. Risk breakdown structure at ERA, how do we start? So ERA will provide each client with a standard risk breakdown structure. So again, the base to start with, we're not going to have a, an open you know, um, a database, uh, which will fit the context of the business, external regulatory, environmental, government, etc. 
uh, management, project management, resourcing, uh, organization, technical, so design, performance, safety, security, and commercial risk, which is inter in, excuse me, internal procurement, again, the supply chain, vendors, and clients. And you can see a little example of risk categories there on, on the far right. So what are the benefits of an integrated ERA risk management module? Well, of course, it will help your corporation have the greater ability to prevent or react to events that could impact goals and objectives, enables management and the board to have a more consistent view of an approach to risk, right? Because it's like anything. If you're not measuring and know what's happening, how are you going to be able to uh, evaluate it? The manager will be, have, will be more aware of the risk at all levels. So again, looking at the speed vulnerability, right? So you have to look at all levels and make decisions to set goals utilizing that understanding. So if you don't take into account the vulnerability, you may not be able to understand how you're going to deal with it. Ability to customize, to integrate into companies' existing organizational framework and culture. And I think Pete Haddad had that question. So if we give you a standardized uh, dynamic form, say in the risk module, uh, can you customize? And of course the answer is yes. So we have standardized risk reporting and improved focus and perspective on risk. So uh, thank you very much for everybody for listening. I apologize for the British interruption. <laughs> and uh, are there any questions? <laughs>